they ministered so much more um, back to us as well. Um, and so, so we're going to look at um, some, some cool um, aspects that I think they did a great job of, um, of showing us. Um, but today we're going to talk about being primed to respond. So as you guys know, our, our youth group name is Primed. Um, and it's based off of the, the parable in, in Luke 8 about the sower and the seed. Um, but, but we as, as believers, we have that opportunity, not just at salvation, but every single day to respond to the word of God in our lives, right? When you, when you open up your Bible in the morning to read, you're going to read something that God's given you, and then he's given you an opportunity to then respond to that as well. And we can respond in, in a few different ways. There's a, there's a verse in Acts that gives us three responses that we, that we often see. Sometimes when we read the word of God, we respond in mocking. You guys have probably all heard that, right? You tell somebody about the word of God and they go, there's no way you can believe that the whole earth flooded, right? You hear that sometimes. And then there's a second response that some of them said, hey, we will hear you again on this matter. And that can go one of two ways. Either, hey, they're thinking about it, but they just need a little more time, or maybe they're just shoving that decision off because they don't really want to deal with it, right? And perhaps they, they run out of time, unfortunately, right? But then that third response that we see in Acts is that they believe. And so we, every, every single time you receive the word of God, you have one of those three options. You can mock it, you can push it off or, or, or continue to think about it, right? Or you can believe it. And so, man, my prayer, and, and, and as we celebrate these seniors, my, my prayer is just that, man, as we receive the word of God, that we would respond to our Savior. There's a, there's a verse in, um, in John that talks about how um, the shepherd, right, or the, the sheep respond to the voice of their shepherd, okay? John 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So in the vein of graduation, I'm giving you guys homework, Okay. You guys ready? I hope you guys actually do it. Okay, go, when you get done, go to YouTube and, and, and search something in there of the sheep responding to the shepherd, okay? And many of you guys know exactly what I'm about to say, but sheep have this incredible ability to respond to the voice of their shepherd. See, the, the top video when I, when I searched for that was this guy, this shepherd was standing in front of all his sheep and he trained three different people to call his sheep. They tried to say the exact same words, the same voice inflection, everything. So one by one, each one of them walked up and walked up to, the, to the, the fence that's right in front of the pasture and they started calling for the sheep. So the first one gets up there, really good imitation, calling out, calling out, and the sheep don't give a care. Second one walks up, does a great job of trying to imitate, nothing. Sheep don't even look at him. Third one walks up, same thing. Walks up to the fence, tries to yell as loud as they can to get the sheep's attention. Nothing. But then when the shepherd walks up to the fence, he starts, to, he starts his call, and immediately you see about five or six sheep pop their head up. And then as he continues calling, all of the sheep eventually just start walking towards the shepherd. And it's such a beautiful picture as, as, as it is of the church that, man, we should know the voice of our shepherd. That when he calls, we should answer him, and that we should come running. It reminds me of, of, of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2, right, or chapter 2 or 3, is that God calls Samuel and says, hey, Samuel, and Samuel jumps up, and he's ready to go, but he doesn't know whose voice it is, because verse 7 in chapter 3 says that he doesn't know God at this point, right? And so he jumps up, and he says, Eli, did you call me? And Samuel says, or, or, and Eli says, no, I, I don't know what you're talking about, go back to sleep. And then it happens again, and Samuel jumps up, ready to go, and he says, Eli, did you call me? No, go back to sleep. And then it happens a third time, and this time Eli says, next time you hear it, respond, hey, God, what is it? Respond to the Lord, not responding to Eli, right? And so you guys know the story. Samuel does so. He, he, he responds to God, and God gives him a pretty tough message to then turn around and give Eli. And so, man, are we faithful enough to when God calls our name, we're going to jump up ready to go? Because, man, that's what God's calling us to do. The sheep respond to the voice of the shepherd. And, man, this is the vision of our youth ministry. As primed, we desire to be good ground found in Luke chapter 8. See, in, in Luke chapter 8, verses 3 um, to 18, it gives the parable of the sower of the seed, and we see four different grounds, right? It, it, all, it all gets defined after Jesus says it, but the seed is the word of God, 
it falls on the ground, and we are the ground. And there's four types of ground talked about. There's the wayside. The wayside is when the seed hits the ground, the birds come up, and they take it away, okay, which pictures Satan coming and taking that seed out of your life before, right? And then we see the rocky ground. And the rocky ground pictures the, 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 the difficult times in our life, the, the struggles that we have, right? When we, when we receive the seed, it starts growing, but it immediately fizzles out, right? Because the sun comes, right? And, and it doesn't have the root system to get in there and grow, right? And the third ground is the thorny ground. And this is the one that hits me a lot because the thorny ground pictures the cares of this world. So when that seed hits the ground and penetrates, then the, the, the roots try to go down, but they keep hitting thorns and thistles, and, and the, the, the plant doesn't make it because it's so, it's, it's so desirous of all the cares of this world and not, not focused on their father. But our vision for the youth ministry is to be good ground. And this good ground is described in a couple really cool ways. The Bible talks about how we're supposed to respond with a good and honest heart. Having heard the word, we keep it. And then verse 18 talks about how we need to take heed, therefore, how we hear. Because when you read the word of God, it matters how you're reading it. And I'm not talking about the, ver the, the version or the, the way the, the language or what language you read it in, any of that. It matters about when you're reading the word of God, do I actually look at it and say, this is the word of God. Whatever it has to tell me, I'm going to do because this is the word of God speaking in my life. There's an incredible verse um, that, that, I've been, that I've been really um, thinking on um, in 1 Thessalonians 2. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Right? So when we, when we respond to the word of God, we need to respond as it is in truth, the very words of God. But see, as believers, it matters how we respond to the God, how we respond to God, because the fruit that you bear depends on your response to God and His Word. See, I always like this analogy. If you guys have ever had like a, a really shriveled up sour grape, right? You put it in your mouth; it's not crisp. You put it in your 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 when you bite down, it squishes. You got yeah. I'm getting nasty vibes already, right? That grape is not good. Or you have a big juicy grape that when you bite it, it, ex it explodes in your mouth, right? And man, th that tastes awesome. But how we respond to God, that depends on the type of fruit. And I don't want to give God lumpy, squishy grapes, do you? Man, I want, God's, I want the fruit of my life to be, to, be, to be pleasing unto the Lord. And man, we had, we had a cool, couple of cool examples of this. Um, so Eli, the first one you saw in the video, um, we had a winter camp here for the first time in a, in a couple years. And Eli came to winter camp, and he looked around, and he was like one of the only upperclassmen there. And Eli's really cool because most of the time he's, he's, he's a follower. He's, he's cool with supporting the leader, standing up when he needs to, right? And he, he, he's just there, a strong, silent type, right? But Eli looked around at winter camp and saw that he was one of the only upperclassmen. And you know what? He decided, I'm going to lead. When we had group discussions, he jumped in, he shared, he was leading most of our discussions, right? Because he looked around and knew that God was calling him to lead. And so God, he responded to God in the way that God asked him to. And then Madeline, who was the second person in the video, right? Most of you guys know her. Madeline lost her older sister from the youth group, Becca, right? So they, um, Becca graduated, and I think Madeline was a sophomore at the time, maybe going into junior year. And so Madeline, that was really hard for her because Becca's one of her best friends, they always hung out together, and now Madeline didn't have anybody to hang out with in the youth group, right? But her response to the Lord was that she was going to go pour into somebody else. And so she looked around and saw Kaya Cease, who was an incoming freshman at the time, and she poured her life into Kaya, because she was responding to, to, to a trial going on in her life of losing her sister out of the youth group, right? And responding in a way that, that blessed somebody else. And so, man, I hope we see that over and over again today as we study that, that it really matters how we respond to God. So we're going to look at John chapter 16 if you want to start turning there. But first, let's pray for our time together. Father God, we love you. We ask, Father, that you would just be glorified here today. God, you have worked in and through these seniors that we're celebrating, Lord. And, and God, we just give you all the glory, God, because 
despite the incredible um, in, in outpouring from their parents, despite being loved on um, in this church, God, you deserve all the glory because you're the God, you're the God that works in and through us. We're, we're, we're molded into your image because you gave us your image. God, you created us in your image. And so, God, would you give us a sweet time in your word today, learning about how it's, it, we need to be primed to respond to the word of the Lord in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so if you want to turn over to John chapter six, 16 with me. This is a cool passage because Jesus is about to leave the earth, right? But he's telling us about the Holy Spirit that's going to be coming, and he's, th this Holy Spirit's going to come and, 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 and fill some of the roles that Jesus is going, to be, um, is going to be leaving when he leaves the earth, right? As a disciple of Jesus, when Jesus leaves, you're, you're probably going to be pretty nervous. But we see in this passage about what the Holy Spirit's job is as he leaves. So let's look at John chapter 16. We'll read verses 1 to 13. It says, These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whither thou goest. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of three things here. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Verse 9, of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go, not to, my, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And so man, this, like I said, this is a cool passage for us to look at on, on senior recognition, right? Because not calling you parents Jesus by any means, right? But you guys are about to send your, your kids, and many of you guys have already done this or it's coming soon, you're sending your kids out into the world in, in some respects, right? And so you, at leaving their life in that, in that immediate, um, re close relationship, right, you're trusting the Holy Spirit in their lives to do the things that he was going to do in the disciples as well. And I know that's a tough thing. My son's seven, and I'm not ready for it. <laughs> I've got some years, so I'll be asking you guys for some advice, right? But man, that's a tough thing to do, is to send your, your, your kid off when you don't know all the, all the trials that they're going to face. But we see here in verse 3, we see a really important principle about responding to God. In verse 3, it says, And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. So we saw that in, in verse 3, they were, they were going to come after the disciples and try to kill them, right? And we saw they were successful with many of them, right? All of them, uh, um, according to history, we believe that all of them died for their faith, right? So Jesus is warning them, hey, they're going to come after you. But why are they doing these things? Because they don't know the Father. See, and, and we as believers, we're going to interact with people all the time that don't know the Father. And it's kind of frustrating, isn't it? Because you say, you say something that, that you think is just rock solid, going to change their life, and they go, well, that's cool, and they walk off. Doesn't feel very good, does it? And, but we, you, we have to realize as believers that they don't know the Father. So the thing that you read in your devotion this morning that changed your life, it's not going to mean the same to them because they don't know the Father. Now, it doesn't mean we, don't, we stop, right? We continue to go. But what we need to know is that we have to be patient. Because I would venture to say not many of you in this room received the gospel the first time you heard it. Some of you have, and praise the Lord. My birth dad had that, had that um, uh, testimony, and it was sweet. The first time to his recollection that he heard the gospel, he received it. Pretty cool. But not many of us are that way, right? Most of us, it took, a, it took a while. And when we were taught a doctrine, it took a little while for us to understand it. And maybe the first time we read a Bible story, we're like, oh, what is this? But over and over again, God worked in you. As you got to know the Father, you responded to, the, to his, to his um, action in your life. And so, man, when we as believers are sharing our faith, 
We really have to be careful and understand that these people don't know the Lord. And man, we have to fight laziness really hard. Because when we hear stories about people sharing the gospel, usually we only hear the story about when they actually, when they actually received it, right? We don't hear about the years and the years of prayer, of, of investment, right? We don't hear those parts. All we hear is, hey, praise the Lord, they, we, we talked about this and they received, the, and we, they received Christ. And so we kind of get this vision of, man, that's what evangelism is. You just go talk to somebody on the street and they receive Christ, right? But man, so many times we have to be so patient and we have to fight that laziness in our life. See, because if you're going to evangelize to somebody and they're willing to sit down with you, perhaps it's going to take six months. Maybe you need to meet with them 30 times before they finally get it. As Brownie can probably attest to, there's so many times where Brownie tells, tells me something and for, for whatever reason, I hear it, doesn't click until somebody else tells me it too. And that's kind of the plight of a lead pastor because that happens a lot to him. He's saying things over and over from the pulpit, then, some, then a guest speaker comes in and says it and he goes, did you hear what that guy said? And Brownie's like, yeah, I've been saying it for months. But man, for some reason, it takes a little while to sink in, right? And think about this with discipleship. If you're discipling somebody, at some point, if they haven't already, they're gonna take a step back. How are you gonna respond to that? Are you going to look at it and go, man, I guess this isn't the person, he's not faithful, maybe we'll try again in five years? Or are you going to be patient with them knowing that you took step back in your life as well and you keep fighting through it? Because they need you to fight through it. Man, so many of the, of the um, testimonies that were shared from the seniors, one that comes to mind specifically was between Maddox and Crystal Sanchez. And Maddox talked about how over and over and over again, Maddox fought and fought and fought. It was about his like freshman year of high school. He was struggling with his faith. And he met with Crystal Sanchez over and over and over again. And from his own mouth, he talked about how, how frustrated Crystal must have been with his lack of progress. But Crystal stuck with it and stuck with it. And man, now, now Maddox is, is graduating high school and he's sharing his faith with, with, with people at school. And so all that investment was worth it. But we have to be patient. And we think about this even with our Bible reading too, right? See, if you're like me, sometimes we get in that spot where we're like, I got 15 minutes for you, God. But even though I have, I'm only giving him 15 minutes, what do I expect of him? Life change. I'm giving you 15 minutes, God. Give me something that will change my life. But what if God has like six cross-references for you to chase down? Are you going to have time for that with 15 minutes? Probably not, Right? So we have to be patient with the Lord that, man, if, I, if, if, I'm gonna, if I'm only willing to give him a few minutes, man, God can only give me so much in that few minutes. But if I sit down and I give him two hours, man, God's going to use those two hours for his glory, right? So, man, we have to fight this laziness that we see over and over again. Man, I, one, of the, one of the cool stories about uh, Maddox, who I've already mentioned, is in his junior year, we, 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 were at, we were eating lunch somewhere, and we, had an, we made an agreement. We said, hey... We're going to start meeting, and I, we're going to challenge each other to reach out to somebody once a week. Maybe it's a complete failure, maybe it's a salvation, who knows, but we're going to commit to once a week trying to share our faith or trying to invite somebody to church, right? And I'm proud to say Maddox kept up on that agreement so well. Man, we, we do this thing called weekly challenge in youth where we all challenge each other to pray every single day for an opportunity to love, encourage, or witness to somebody. And then on Sunday mornings, they might be doing it right now, um, on Sunday mornings, we get together and we share what those experiences were like. And there's failures, there's successes. Maddox was always, um, he, he would always say that it was a failure, even though it was like, definitely not. Like 99% success, 1% failure. And he goes, I got a failure to share with you guys this morning. I'm like, dude, I wish I had those types of failures, right? But Maddox graduates as the career leader in weekly challenges shared. Now, I don't know that for sure because we don't keep count, but pretty sure he was because every single week in there, we call for weekly challenge reports and we wait for Maddox to raise his hand because he was somebody that was sharing his faith over and over and over again. So let's keep going down John chapter 16. Let's jump down to verse uh, 9, I believe, or no, let's go to 8 first. John 16 verse 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of three things, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because 
they, uh, sorry, because I go to my father and you see me no more. Verse 11, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So we see those three things, right? They're underlined on your screen. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we're going to be reproved of all of those things, right? So the first one's kind of easy. We need to be reproved of our sin. But I think the really cool part of this is the, the why behind why we're called to be reproved of our sin. Because verse 9 says, of sin, because they believe not on me. I mean, it makes you wonder how much of our sin is in regards to our lack of belief in God. See, because if you truly believed God that it's better to give than to receive, then we'd be spending less time on Amazon. And if you truly believed that Jesus was coming back at any moment, then we'd be telling our friends and our family about Jesus. And if we truly believed that building up treasures in heaven is way more important than building up treasures on earth, we'd stop wasting so much time on social media. And if we truly believed that God would work all things together for the good to those that love him and live according to his purpose, then man, we'd stop worrying so much. Because when a trial comes our way, we're going to know that, yep, I don't know how God's going to pull this one off, but he's going to. One of my, I read this earlier, I'll read it again. First Thessalonians 2.13, it's becoming one of my favorite verses. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I mean, if you trust the word of God to work inside of you, he's going to reprove you of your sin. And he's going to do it in such a gentle, loving way, man. I always tell the students, I'm so grateful that when you get saved, you don't get a laundry list of things you got to fix, right? Because that'd be pretty intimidating. But man, what God's done in my life is he said, okay, this one, we'll work on this one. And then as God works in you to, to, to address that one, you start to, you start to have some victory over it, and so God says, okay, here's another one. He's, he's effectually working in you that believe. So the second thing that he says he's going to reprove us of is righteousness. So we have the good, now, or sorry, we have the bad in sin, now we have the good in righteousness, right? And the reason he reproves of his righteousness is pretty cool, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. So why do we need to be reproved of righteousness? Because Jesus is no longer on the earth, and we, the, the disciples no longer had this incredible example to just walk around and follow all the time. They couldn't just say, huh, I wonder how, God, how Jesus would answer this and go ask him. Or they couldn't just watch him and say, man, I, want, I need to learn how to do this certain thing, I'm just going to watch Jesus do it. So instead, we have the Holy Spirit doing that for us, right? Because we have his example in God's word, but we also have the Holy Spirit working in us to be that example. And so, man, one of, the, one of my favorite youth group stories of all time now, I think I've shared it about 30 times, is Hannah. The first day I met her, we, I walked into youth group. I'd never seen her before. Um, I found out later she, was, um, she had come because um, Maddox invited her. But I didn't know that, so I walked up to introduce myself, found out she got invited by Maddox. But I asked her this question. I said, what brings you here? And she said, verbatim, I'll never forget this, she said, Maddox is so passionate about his faith, I want to eat what he eats. Yeah. I'll never, I don't think I'll ever hear a statement like that again in my life. That was incredible. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. This girl I'd never met before, I didn't even know she was a Christian, nothing. I met her, and that's, that's the, one of the first things she said to me. And man, how beautiful is that? Because in 1 first, in first Corinthians 11, we see um, Paul say, be ye followers of me, even all, as I also am of Christ. And so, man, we need those people to walk before us. And parents, you guys are doing that so faithfully. Thank you. Our young people need that. Man, I, I got to brag on Steve for a minute because uh, about a year ago, I challenged you guys to come alongside one of our young people and just tell them every Sunday that you're happy to see them. Because I had to learn this in junior high ministry that when kids don't show up for church, a lot of times it's not their fault. They had a tournament, the car broke down, right? Like, I, I, I love watching students that as soon as they get their car and their license, they start showing up to church all the time. That's a good indication, right? It means that they want to be here, they just, they're, they're stuff in their lives, they can't always find a ride, right? Well, Steve took me up on this opportunity, and he went alongside Hannah and just welcomed her every day. Uh, I, I, can't, I, I, I still remember when Hannah first told me about that, because she goes, who's that coach guy you keep telling me about? Yeah, like he keeps talking to me on Sundays. And man, even if, if you guys were investors, you guys have already heard the story, right? 
because uh, Steve uh, spoke about it in Investors a couple weeks ago. He talked about how this, this young lady who was so excited to be here was growing so much. And man, thank you, Steve, for taking me up on that challenge because it was such a blessing in her life. And, and I, can, I can see it working in her already. And so our last thing that we're approved of in verse 11, we're approved of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And so once again, we have the bad, we have the good, but this judgment is how we tell what the good and the bad is, right? Because the, the prince of this world's going to get judged. And man, praise the Lord, because he seems like he's having his way in too many cultures right now, right? We, there's, a, there's a cool verse in, um, in Isaiah that, that, we'll, that we'll get to. It, um, Isaiah 520, it says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And how true is this verse in our culture right now? How many times do you come across somebody that says something that's good and calls it evil, or that sees something that's evil and of the devil and they're trying to call it good? Man, we need the Holy Spirit of God to give us this judgment so that we can discern between the good and the bad. And our seniors need this as they, as they go off to college because, man, they're going to be faced with some difficult things. I've told them over and over again, when I was in college, my, my, the head of our, our, of our um, religion department was an atheist. And we started an email string back and forth. He was trying to convince me that Paul was an arrogant dude and we shouldn't trust him and all these things. And eventually I had to look at that email and just stop responding. Because even when I was like, I got a good answer for you this time, you know what he did? He would drop that subject and move on to something else to try and trip me up again. It was clear what his intention was, right? And so we need the Holy Spirit to be able to discern between these things. Because when, when we go off into this world, we need to see something that's good and we need to have the discernment of God to look at it and call it good. And we need to look at something that's evil and have the discernment from God to look at it and call it evil. Because that's what God's called us to do. He's given us, he's reproving us of that judgment. And so man, verse 13, such a beautiful end to this little passage. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. And how much do we need the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth? So if you were here a couple weeks ago when Pastor Kevin Pesky was here, he, he talked about um, how, how children are like arrows in Psalms, right? Psalms 127, 4 through 5 says, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. I mean, I've, I've, I've always heard that verse. I, I always kind of focused on the part where it said you're supposed to have lots of arrows, right? Um, but... <laughs> The, the part that I never really understood until Pastor Kevin was speaking about it was that, man, we're, when we send our kids out into the world, all of our hard work, all of our prayer, all of our encouragement kind of comes to, a, to, a, to a, um, a precipice, right? Because think about it. when it, you These people probably weren't buying arrows from Bass Pro, right? So that means they had to make them, or they had to buy them from somebody that made them, right? And so can you imagine how important it is when you're shooting an arrow that that arrow's straight? You builders, right? My grandpa taught me this. When you go buy a two by four from, from Home Depot, what do you do? You tilt it up and you look down and make sure it's straight. Because some of those things aren't straight and you put it in your cart and you can't tell. But you put it up, get a good angle at it, you can tell it's straight. Well man, the same thing with an arrow, right? If you, if you have spent your time and your energy making sure that your arrow, your children's are straight, your children's are straight, right? Then man, when, when it's that time to come, when, you, when you're going to pull back that arrow, you're pointing them at the target, you're pointing them at a relationship with Jesus for the rest of their life. When you let go, I sure hope that arrow's straight. Because we can't go catch it. Some of you guys are pretty athletic. I don't see Drew in here. But man, maybe he could go catch it. He's pretty fast, right? One of the best athletes I've ever seen, right? When he shoots that arrow, maybe he could go get it. But when you let go, that arrow's gonna go where it's gonna go. And even if you're calm, your release is solid, if you let go and that arrow is not straight, it's not going to hit the target. And so this is why we spend so much time and energy investing in our kids so that when we come to this time when they're graduating, when they're going off to college, when they're getting a job, they're going to hit that target that, that, we've, that we've guided them at because God's made them a straight arrow through the faithfulness of you as parents. And so, man, as we respond to the Lord and, and, and we learn how to be primed to respond, there's so many awesome examples that we see in the Word of God. So let's look at a few of them this morning. Um, the first one we're going to look at is in Luke 1. 
You can turn there if you want. We see the example and we see a contrast between Zechariah and Mary. Okay? Zechariah, if you remember, was a priest. Okay? The, the Bible calls him faithful to all the ordinances of God. It even uses the word blameless. So this was a man that followed after the Lord. And so you guys know the story. God approaches from this with, with an angel, and he comes to Zechariah, and he says, hey, in your old age, you've never been able to have a kid. I'm going to bless you with a kid. And not only am I going to bless you with a kid, this, this kid's going to be special. This kid, the Bible talks about he's going to turn the, the hearts of the fathers to their children. This guy's going to come and point the nation of Israel, who's been ignoring me, back to God. Pretty special kid, right? And you combine that with the fact that he's of an old age, he doesn't think he can have kids anymore. This is a pretty, this is a pretty tough to believe um, prophecy, right, that he's receiving. But when he receives that prophecy, you can see it up on the screen, his answer is, whereby shall I know this? Which, think about that. You have an angel of the Lord standing in front of you, giving you a message, and your response is, how am I supposed to know that this is true? It's the angel of the Lord standing in front of you. That's how you know it's true. And so that's why God responds and, and takes away his voice, right? He, 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 he isn't able to speak until his son is named, which, as you guys know, is John the Baptist. Pretty cool dude. But then, let's contrast that with Mary. Very, very similar circumstances, right? Zechariah was really old, past childbearing ages, right? Was going to have an incredible kid. Well, Mary, never been with a man. Pretty miraculous birth as well, right? But despite the, the differences in the, in the, in the miracle that, that, that both of them got, that um, Zechariah and, and, and Mary both were able to have children, right? Is that Mary, first of all, wasn't with a man, but also the prophecy about Jesus was a little bit more incredible. Like, it's awesome to hear that your son's going to go lead the people back to God, right? But this Jesus guy was going to be a king. And the Bible says that his kingdom would have no end. And so he, it would have been hard for him to believe that as well. But Mary's response, how shall this be? How shall this be? See, there's a, maybe there's a, a hint of, of, of disbelief or whatnot in there, but mostly what Mary's asking is, how are you going to accomplish this, God? She's not asking, hey, are you sure I'm the right person? Are you sure you picked the right person? I'm not married, all these things, right? No. She just says, how are you going to accomplish this, God? And so this young woman who, who had an, an incredible prophecy given to her has such a, such a faithful response. Compared to Zechariah, who was, man, faithful dude all his life, he, he had a moment of, of, um, of doubt. I mean, th this really hit me when, when Brian and I were in Zambia because we, we, we flew into Chicago um, and we were down in the hotel. I was working on something um, kind of late and all of a sudden this guy walks into the, to the hotel lobby and I'm like charging my phone or whatever. He literally just hands me um, his phone and he says, hey, will you charge this? I'm going to run to McDonald's. Like, sir, you don't know if I'm a serial killer or something, I guess, but like he went ahead and gave it to me. I charged it and he came back in, you know, a couple minutes, right? But it hit me while he was gone that I have about 10 minutes to construct my response to this dude. I don't have that very often, right? If you're evangelizing somewhere, sometimes you have about seven seconds to decide what you're going to say. And hopefully you're prepared. Hopefully you're thinking through some things, right? But you've got you to go off the cuff, right? You've got to rely on the Holy Spirit to speak through you. But I had 10 minutes to prepare for this dude to come back. But when he came back, he told me this funny story. Apparently, he tried to walk through the McDonald's drive-thru, and they shot him down, I guess. But, um, so he was telling me this story, and so then he like, started hurriedly walking away, and I started to speak, and all of a sudden, he stopped, turned around and looked at me, and I froze, and I said, have a good day. And man, that hit me so hard. I had 10 minutes to prepare to talk to this dude, and I froze. And I didn't respond to the Lord's God, the, the God, God call in my life. Because sometimes we only get a few seconds to respond. Even though I had 10 seconds to prayer, I only had a couple seconds to respond to, to what God was, was asking me to do, right? And man, we have to be ready. We have to be ready for that time when God calls our number. The second example that we'll look at is Hannah. In 1 uh, Samuel chapter 1 and 2, similar story to Zechariah and Mary. She's the, she hasn't had a kid, right? And she's praying for one and praying for one. And all of a sudden, she makes a covenant with God and says, God, if you'll bless me with a child... I'm going to give it right back to you. What many of you, uh, of you parents have, have prayed as well, 
is that, God, if you bless me with a child, I'm going to give it back to you so that, man, this, this child will serve you. And so when she's able to have a child, she, she, goes to the, she goes to the priest in the tabernacle and says, hey, here you go. This is my child that I've been praying for. You can have it. You, this, this child is, I'm dedicating this child's life to the service of the Lord. Difficult thing to do, right? And that's where we, we see the cool verse about, for this child I have prayed, right? That was Hannah. But yet in chapter 2, the whole first part of that, that chapter, we see that Hannah spends the first 10, 15 verses just praising the Lord for his goodness, for his sovereignty, and his holiness. After just giving up her child to the Lord. Even though she promised it, that was very difficult to do. And yet, what is, what is, what is Hannah's response to God? Praise and honor and, and glorifying the sovereignty of God. Because she thought back to, man, this is the, this is the child that God gave me to begin with. So what, what else would I do but give it right back to him? Our next one is Zipporah. Okay, this, is one, this one's one of my favorites. Um, it, uh, the, the youth have heard it about a million times, so there's, there's none of them in here, so I can say it. Um, but Zipporah uh, was, was Moses' wife, right? <clears throat> and so God is calling Moses. This is after, in Exodus 4, this is after God has appeared um, to Moses at the, and, and given him the two signs of his putting his hand in the shirt and the cloak or whatever, pulling it out in his leprous, right? And then putting it back in and it's clean again. And then, and then also the famous one of him throwing his staff down on the ground and it turning into a snake. So God had already told this guy, hey, I'm going to use you. And God was preparing and preparing and preparing. Well, Moses had been working, right, with his, with his father-in-law Jethro. And so he goes off to Jethro and says, hey, God's calling me to Egypt. Is it cool if I go? Jethro says, yep, go do what God's calling you to do. So as Moses is coming back, something incredible happens. The Lord appears to, to Moses and Zipporah and looks like he's going to kill him. Which, we talk about this in the youth group a lot. If you're reading a story of the Bible and it doesn't make sense to you, lock in. Because if it caught your attention, there's a reason for that. So lock in and see what incredible thing God has to show you. So you guys know the story. Zipporah steps up, responds to the Lord, goes and circumcises her son and casts it at Moses' feet. Pretty weird, right? This is one of those times where we should be reading that Bible and be like, yeah, I need to lock in here because God's got something to tell us. Well, think about this. Have you guys ever felt a strong conviction from the Lord and you don't know what it is? Perhaps it's something that God's been trying to tell you for weeks and you know you haven't done right, but you've just been putting off and ignoring. See, if that happened to you, what's the first thing that would come to your mind? What's, if you knew God was upset with you, what's the, you all probably have it if you would think for a second, like, yeah, God's probably upset about this. Well, that's what happened to Zipporah. She knew we hadn't, been, we hadn't circumcised our son, so she did it right away. Didn't make any sense that God was coming to kill him when he had already said he was going to use him to, to lead the children of Israel out, right? But he, she, had a, she had an opportunity to respond to the Lord, and she was faithful to do so. The next one is one that you guys are very familiar with. It's the woman at the well. Okay, so Jesus and his disciples are coming uh, towards, um, <clears throat> at the, they see the well, right? And the disciples say, hey, we're going to go off to the city. Jesus goes and talks to this Samaritan, or the, the woman at the well, right? And, and you guys know the story. She, uh, she, she's at the well at a very interesting time, okay, in the heat of the day, not when you would normally go get water. And they have this incredible interaction together, right? The woman at the well starts talking to Jesus. Jesus starts telling her about all her past with men and all these things, and and man, some, some, somehow the woman at the well perceives, hey, you must be a prophet. And so, man, one of my favorite um, sayings in the Bible, she runs off and she starts yelling, come see the man that told me everything I ever did. Well, think about this. She goes to that city. The disciples had just gone there. And what did they, came back? What did they come back with? You guys remember? Food, right? So they came to this city, came back with food. Well, guess what the woman at the well came back with when she went to the city? A whole city of people that wanted to hear from the Lord. Jesus' chosen people, his disciples had just gone to that city, and they came back with some bread. And yet this woman, who had known Jesus for 10 minutes, goes to that city, and she tells them all, and they all just want to go meet, come meet the Savior. Man, how convicting would that be if you're Peter? We were just at that city. Nobody asked us about Jesus, right? But man, this woman responds to the, to, the, to the calling of the Lord in her life. And so man, this, I think this is a really big principle for us. Your response to God 
exposes your heart. Your response to God exposes your heart. See, raise your hand if, if you're a happy five coach in here. Okay. Put yourselves in my shoe for a second so I don't feel completely terrible about myself, okay? So I had this interaction with a parent yesterday, and the parent who I've had his kid a couple times, he walks up to me, and he's like, um, he was watching Dwayne's team play, right? And he looks to, he, so he's watching everybody play while we, we're talking after everything's done, and he comes up to me, and he goes, man, Dwayne's team is so incredible at passing. See, because he has a five-year-old and like a seven or eight-year-old, and he was like, man, Dwayne's team little, of little five-year-olds was passing better than my, my, my son's seven-year-old team. Well, you know what I thought when I heard that story? My team doesn't pass very well. Like, what, what am I doing? Why would I respond that way? Why wouldn't I respond and go, man, Dwayne's incredible. I'm going to go tell him. I did tell you that story later. But why wouldn't I respond and just be thankful what, what, what God was doing through Dwayne? But instead... My sinful old nature looked at myself and felt bad about myself, even though my friend was, was, was praising one of my good friends, right? That doesn't make any sense, but, but man, our response to God exposes our heart. So man, as we close, man, I, I just want us to be reminded that, that this passage in John chapter 16 ends with one of the most famous pa- uh, verses in the Bible. Verse 33, these things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So despite your failures, despite your flaws, these graduating seniors, whatever trials they're going to face, they can know God's already overcome the world. It's not up to you. We talked about it also in the, in the, um, in the family conference about we, we, during the singles night, Pastor Kevin Pesky told everybody, oh, to, told all the girls in the room that were single, hey, your boyfriend's not your savior. Pretty good advice for a young girl, right? Well, praise the Lord, we don't have to be other people's saviors as well because we already have a savior. And he died on the cross 2,000 years for us and he's already paid it. All we have to do is go tell people, up, tell people about it. And when we go through trials, God wants to work those things together for the good. If you stay faithful to him and live according to your purpose. So we need to be reminded of the fact that he has already overcome the world. See, we, the, the senior high had a, had a winter camp this past year. And our theme was, um, was to, that, that God is for you. Because, man, doesn't it? I, I think you can remember back when you were younger. It's hard to remember that sometimes, isn't it? I just had a student I was talking to the other day that just felt like a complete failure because of something that she didn't respond very well to. But man, I I look back and I go, but you've been faithful for five years now. Don't let one little mistake taint your view of what God's been doing you for the past five years. So we have to be reminded of the fact that God is for us and that every trial and temptation that we come across, he's going to be working it together for the good. See, one of your your probably favorite verses is 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You can probably quote it with me. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But verse 17, why are we given this scripture? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished unto all good works. So why are you, why are you called to respond to the word of God? Why are you even given the word of God in the first place? It's so that God can make you perfect, so that he can sanctify you through his word. Man, what an incredible promise that we can hold on to. So man, once again, I, I just, I, I want to publicly say thank you to the, to the class of 23. They've been such an incredible group to work with. Um, when Addie and I first came in, they were seventh graders, so we got to spend six years with them. And man, what incredible young men and women they are. But man, my prayer for them is that they would be good ground as they go out into this world. Because there's not a whole lot of good ground out there these days. Somebody that's going to receive the word of God, and it's going to bear fruit in their lives that they're going to stay faithful to what God's already told them. Man, I'm I'm so thankful because they've had some incredible teachers through Faith Place, through the junior high, through the high school. A couple of them got up and thanked. If you you weren't weren't able to be here first service, they already thanked you for your incredible time and energy spent in their life. So thank you for that. But man, what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to remember, remember those truths and those promises as they go off to college. See, I had, I'll close with this, I had an interesting experience with a friend um, a pretty awesome um, invitation. I had a friend from high school message me the other day, and he said, hey, God's, God's been working on me. Can we get together? I just want to learn how to follow the Lord better. 
pretty cool message, right? Probably one of the best I've ever received. So we set up a time, we were gonna go hang out, right? And we were supposed to hang out at like 4.30 or something like that. Well, it's seven o'clock, I still haven't heard from him. So finally he messaged me back and said, hey, sorry I had to work later or whatever, so we set up another time. So next day comes, supposed to meet around the same time, never hear from him. And so you can imagine, all throughout the week I was like, man, did I say something wrong? Did I come off too strong? Was I annoying? All of these things, right? Well, then the next week, he messaged me back, and it was not what I expected. His response was, man, I'm so sorry I didn't respond to you. I'm really struggling with the fact that if I reach out to God, will he love me back? Or if I start a relationship with God and I screw up, is he still going to be there for me? See, it had nothing to do with me. Maybe I was annoying, who cares, but his, his issue was, was he was dealing with the God of the universe working on his heart. So man, can we be reminded of the fact that we just watch where God's working, go be a part of it, and respond to the word of God in our lives. So as we, as we end today, I, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I don't know what God's working on in your life, but man, will you respond? Will you just say, hey God, would, would, would you just give me an opportunity? Brian and Bobby have both encouraged me recently with this. One of, one of Bobby's many sayings is that if you're not sure whether a door is open, you know how you figure it out? You walk towards it. And you, even if it's one of those sliding glass doors, right? I've run, I've run into those things before thinking it would open, okay? <laughs> but man, you're not sure that door's open? Go walk towards it. Get a better look. Because man, maybe, maybe when your nose gets right up to it, that door opens and you're ready to go. So go ahead and stand. <clears throat> so as we, as we conclude, please come respond to the Lord. I don't know what it is, but, but you know what God's asking you to do. So the, the altar's open. Come take some, take some time to just respond to the Lord and tell him that you're ready. You're ready for whatever he's calling you. Let's pray. God, we love you. Father God, would you, would you work in our hearts this morning? God, we, like Zipporah, we probably know what you're asking us to do. But God, would you find us faithful to do it, to take steps toward that door, to see if it's open. God, because we know that you want to work in our lives, God. We know that you're for us. So God, as we pray this morning, God, would you, would you give us the boldness, give us the confidence to respond to you? And God, would, would you work in our hearts both to will and to do of your good pleasure? Lord God, we love you. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Come.